All right, so uh, my name is Caleb Corte, for those of you who don't know, and I've been a part of Abundant Life since probably before I was conceived. So <laughs> give, or <laughs> give or take about eight. <clears throat> give or take about 18 years. Um, so as the time has gotten closer to today, I've become more engaged in giving this mini lesson amidst my final month of high school. Um, you know, growing up is a bright but also sad process, mainly because I'm gonna have to start paying taxes. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, uh, the good significantly outweighs the bad. You know, the greatest thing I've come to realize and learn is, this, is the significance of people. Um, the people God has put in my life, um, you know, created in, in his image, the good and the bad, have all played a role. Um, so I'm going to give a, just a broad thank you to them um, for the people who, like, helped me with the sermon today. So Uncle Arshel and my dad um, and Auntie Monique um, and just, like, my family in general, family and friends uh, for kind of just guiding me to today. Um, and so one thing that I've kind of noticed is the people in my life, you know, they've all taught me different things, but sometimes it's the same topic, but they decide to kind of use different words. Uh, you know, you guys have all kind of been there, that one teacher, they're giving a lesson, you kind of look at them this, with this really big face of confusion, you're, you're kind of like, what are they talking about? But then <laughs> later on, you're talking with your friends, or maybe you're meeting with a tutor, and you, that, it kind of just clicks, you, it gets, um, you kind of just understand it, you're, you have this face of like, ah, okay. Um, and for me, that's why I love economics, at least in its most basic form. It's such a hyper-specific topic, and um, yet it can be so simple as to explain something like supply and demand. You know, I can uh, produce so much of a product and give it to everybody, and they essentially, uh, you know, nobody wants it because everybody already has it. But as soon as I produce a small amount of something and then all of a sudden, everybody wants it, it's demanded because only a select few people have it, you know? Um, meaning I can hike up the price of this product that I've only paid probably $5 to produce and I could sell it for something like 1000 But I just gave you such a simple lesson without having to get into the nitty gritty. Sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how close I'm supposed to hold the mic uh, to my face. Um, all right. But, so where you see these overcomplicated theorems that su explain supply and demand, you know, we all obviously don't have time for that. Um, so we have to dumb it down to something I just gave you for like a quick 30 seconds. And again, we have this like expression of like, oh, okay, then you know, that makes sense. And I'm saying all this to say that my journey of learning of high school was seemingly hard to grasp and understand. But as time passed and God's wisdom has seeped into my life and favor fell upon me, I've continued to realize just how easy and easy it is to recognize the messages in front of me. The book of Psalms, in particular Psalm 1, I've learned that even for a non-believer, it's a lesson that kind of just clicks. Everyone can kind of get it. You don't have to be, consult the most educated person ever. Today, you just have me. <laughs> uh, years ago, my dad would drive me to middle school every morning and would have me read a passage from the book of Psalms. Um, you know, he'd have me read a few, but I found that the book of Psalms was sort of a life guide in the way that we as Christians should engage in the world. And as I said moments before, these suggestions are how our actions are reflected in a, a glimpse into the way God sees us. All right, so go ahead and open your pages to Psalm 1. Um, I'll tell you, I would tell you guys a page number, but I'm pretty sure you guys have like 40 different printed versions. Um, so yeah, just go ahead and open to that passage and I'll um, read it out. It goes as follows. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree, planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Psalm 1 presents the reader, the follower, with two options. The way of the world, godless, and the way of the word, God's guidelines. All right, now let's take it back to verse 1, and it goes as, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. 
This verse begins with an assertion of the way in which an individual can find themselves blessed by God. But the word blessed in and of itself has multiple meanings. It's a multifaceted word that also means happy and fortunate. You will be happy, blessed, and fortunate when you follow him. Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. 39 it says, love your neighbor as thyself. It's a, some of the essence of God's law. In the context of the passage, of sin, in the context of the passage, sinners look to the opposite of that with intention, looking to exploit others like parasites. And the ungodly, as it suggests, are individuals who seek separation from God consciously. These ways can easily disguise itself as ways of success. You being accepted into a certain uh, group of people or their so-called prosperity. Evil in and of itself is the deviation from God. The scornful essentially find themselves in the suit, following suit in the path of evil. To be scornful is to scoff, depending on the Bible version you're reading, is to mock anyone that believes that God knows their path, choice, or destiny. They purposely turn away from him in a circum circumstances in search of more fun or a thrilling life, searching for something more, always. It is the same with money. Those who chase the dollars their entire lives often find themselves empty and unhappy with a stack of cash in their laps. Now, the blessed is the person that avoids the temptations of sinners. They find the right people to surround themselves with, to lift them up rather than those who may drag them down. And that not only applies to God and his word, but at school and the people you hang around, sports teams, and even in the workplace. Bad influence appears everywhere, and God gives us the tools to navigate it. See, in verse 2, it may be short, but it holds a whole lot of meaning. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Amen. Within the sentence, you'll notice the symbiotic relationship between delight in the first phrase and meditate in the second. Further, we have to ask why they're put in that order. I noted that it's almost like working out or playing basketball. You know, that one time you go with your friends, and it was really fun, or maybe it's a video game or something as simple as going for a walk. My point being that you did this activity once and you essentially kind of get roped into it. But then all of a sudden, now you have to practice. You got to get your shots up or you have to get in the hours. You have to upgrade your gaming systems to be more precise. Or you just have to get the right walking shoes. You meditated. You thought about what you needed to do to keep the activity up. And Psalms 1 verse 2 calls us to do the same with God and his word, his lifestyle, the lifestyle. Now, we can see that the law of the Lord is found in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But from these books, Jesus has, zo has a zoom in and focus on, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This commandment is regarded by Jesus as the most important commandment, followed by love your neighbor as thyself. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, Jesus says, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So then looking back at verse 2, it essentially focuses on the happiness and blessings that are a product of the avoidance of wickedness and rather meditating and living these commandments out will bring the greatest fulfillment in life. Yeah. Not money, not the drugs, not trying to impress others, but God and your commitment to him. See, now we're in verse 3, and this is where it gets interesting. It's kind of like the Bible's version of a Van Gogh painting. It goes as follows. Wow. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does prospers. There is a metaphor of a tree in an orchard being given water always, whether there is a presumed need for it or not. The picture being nicely illustrated is of a tree getting plenty of nourishing water, and as we do the same with, when following the law of the Lord. In this case, the law would be our water for our souls. Now, let's not get it twisted. This doesn't mean that all of a sudden, uh, all of our wishes are going to be granted. I still don't have an Xbox, so that's... <laughs> all right. But there's a time where blessings do fall upon each and every one of us, which takes us to the next line where, it's, where it says that the tree, in this case us, yields its fruit in season. Let's look at that word again, season. But even then, looking and relying on God's word keeps us strong, which is why the line is followed with and whose leaf does not wither. The following of God most definitely takes discipline when there are so many factors in our lives. It seems every day there's something new that makes you question the validity of Christ, but it's in the faith we have for him that, we've, that we find strength and favor. So when we're looking at verse four, and 
I, we see some of this interesting vocabulary, something definitely new to me. Like verse four says, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Now, initially when I read chaff, I had no idea what it was. I mean, how many do you? So just, just, to, give you, just to give you some context and a quick um, definition, chaff is like the husks, husks of corn or like other types of seeds. Um, but when you look it up on Google, uh, for the definition, uh, it's, so Google's like the internet, it's very helpful. I suggest, you, I su I suggest we all use it. Um, and so it gives you, like you can look up like what's the meaning of a word and it'll, it'll, give, you, it'll give it to you. Um, so I use this, I use, I use this tool. Um, I had to connect to Wi-Fi first. Um, <laughs> Wi-Fi is really complicated, I still don't understand how it works. Um, but when I looked it up, uh, Chaff's other definition was worthless things, like trash. Wow. So to further that, Chaff is dry and unhealthy, is in direct contrast to an irrigated tree, which further emphasizes how our actions of this world and those who follow earthly temptations without the recognition of God run and hide in a cowardly way. So if we look at the image of a seed, when the seed falls to the ground, its surrounding layer of chaff blows away in the wind, it was essentially insignificant, but the seed holds weight. It'll grow into the ground and produce a tree that would then produce more seeds and fruit. And therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You'll notice that this in everyday life. You know, you want to make the right decision. You want to pick up that dollar that someone dropped and give it back to them. You want to help that kid who fell or, you know, someone may have lied to your boss and you want to speak up about it. But then those around you might look at you funny, ask why you're doing it or say, hey, I mean, hey, if it was me, I would have picked up that dollar. I would have put it in my pocket, you know, free money. But in those moments, that one person who might have picked it up, you know, uh, because they're your friends or they don't, they're doing it because you don't want to be left out or you don't want to be judged. But those good decisions you're, you make and your willingness to help is what allows for you to move forward and grow with God. While those who looked at you funny would have done something quite different, they would be left behind, blown in the wind, and, or maybe have just left you. But you'll let, be left standing confidently in the Lord, and in time they'll come back looking to you for what to do. And I would say that verse 6 is pretty self-explanatory. It's a perfect cherry on top, and it kind of goes as follows. The two lines, all right? For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I chose Psalm 1 because it gives you an opening guide on the way in which we as Christians to live our lives. And verse 6 of Psalm 1 tells us the end product of living said life. In Psalm 1, it sets forth two directions in life. One leads to true happiness and the other to misery. Which path will you choose? Thank you for listening. Good morning, church. Sorry, I never talked in front of this many people before. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so my name is Celia Harvey, and I am the daughter of Marie right there and Elder Ezekiel Harvey, if you don't know him. So, yeah. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this youth-led service. And, um, yeah, so please turn to Daniel chapter 6. Today I will be discussing consistency and its importance in the life of a follower of Christ. So, um, it is going to be a long verse, so just bear with me. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of his great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel 
will be in connection with the rules of his religion. The administrators and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius, we are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied, that decision stays. It is an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, your majesty, you know that according to the law of Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, may your God whom you serve so faithfully rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and he couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. The, the lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered and during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Okay, <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> Hold on. All right. So the big idea that I got out of this is that in life you'll face trials, but your deliverance is determined by your faith. Um, so Daniel was consistent in his faith, even though it went against the king's decree and ultimately God's glory was unveiled. Um, so a statement that I'm kind of going by in this message is that consistency with Christ is key. Um, and I want to just ask you guys a few questions. You don't have to respond to them, but just think about it. Um, what role does God play in your life? Are you truly consistent with your faith or do you only talk to him when you need something? Are you truly consistent with your faith, or do you only talk to him when there's trouble? Are you truly consistent with your faith, or do you only act the part at church? And <laughs> are you truly consistent with your faith, or do you only pray when life gets rough? So God's people need to collectively and individually turn to him in the good and the bad. Okay, so my first point is that consistency requires self-discipline. There is a difference between the two. Self-discipline is doing hard things when there is no motivation. 
Consistency, on the other hand, is doing those things and showing up every single day, doing those things day to day to day. In verse five, it states that the administrators and high officers knew that Daniel was deeply invested in his religion because he wasn't hiding it. And the fact that this was known to them all emphasizes that Daniel never hesitated to pray and he was disciplined enough to continue even after the king's decree. On the contrary, for example, my parents always want me to do the dishes. <laughs> okay, so in this case, self-discipline would be to do the dishes after a long day of school with all types of high school drama and never ending homework, right? And this happens sometimes. Um, <laughs> Consistency would be doing it every single day. And although this would appear to be the best option in order to avoid, you know, them complaining about it and me having to do a whole load of dishes, I often don't end up doing that. And not doing those dishes describes a lack of consistency within my own life as a result of no self-discipline. So ultimately, consistency starts with self-discipline, and this begins with your thoughts. Your thoughts lead to your feelings, your feelings lead to your actions, and your actions lead to results, right? Um, I go to the gym, but um, when I go to the gym and I feel like it, I probably would just be wasting my whole membership. The whole point of consistency is doing it when you don't feel like it, right? Um, if you make it a habit, then it ends up in your favor. And I hate to say it, but your actions do have consequences. God's people must be willing to do the hard things on hard days. And what I've learned is that when you focus on that, you attract what God wants you to. Uh, my second point is that consistency needs sacrifice. It's not all cupcakes and rainbows. <laughs> um, an example of this would be me um, when I go to school again. I do have good grades, but oftentimes I don't want to turn in work, right? You never want to turn in work. Um, a lot of times I'd rather just watch Netflix and all my favorite shows, but sometimes I have to sacrifice. Sometimes my dad reminds me to do this, but I do end up sacrificing, studying for those tests, preparing for things I don't want to prepare for, getting agendas ready for my club, and all of this eventually leads to the outcome that I want. In verse 16 to 17, it states that the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den. The king said to him, may your God whom you serve so faithfully rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and he sealed the stone and this, with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue him. Okay, so if you think that Daniel wanted to get thrown into that den, you are crazy. <laughs> he, literally, he sacrificed his life due to his trust in God. And I believe that, or he believed that God will pull through and it was his will. So he did. I don't know if you guys would willingly go into a den full of lions without a smudge of doubt, but I don't know if I could. Um, this did make me think of Proverbs 16, 9, though, which states that, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. So I would assume that Daniel wanted to live after being thrown in the lion's den, but it was the Lord that ultimately led him to get out safely the next morning. And honestly, God could have said, Daniel, it is your time. You, you got to die. But instead, he safely recovered him, right? So we must sacrifice, like Daniel, our doubts, our temptations, our ego, our pride, our ignorance, laziness, indifference, old habits, anything else that display, in order to display God's glory to all. If we don't have trust in God's plan for us, it is a reflection of our faith. And my third point, my final point, is that consistency shows strength in our relationship with God. Imagine that you have a friend that you're close to. And throughout the years, you've noticed that they have tendencies to only come to you when something bad happens. They reach out, they trauma dump all their problems onto you, and then they don't contact you again until something else goes wrong. Does anyone have friends like these? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe go find yourself some new friends. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> in this case, we would be the friend and God would be us, right? So who's to say that we have the right to only turn to him when something is wrong? Should our friend or God not also indulge in the good of our lives? Being a follower of Christ does not mean depending on him during the tough times. It also means praising and honoring him during the good times. It means praying to him at your highest highs and your lowest lows. Of course, Daniel wanted, or of course, Daniel went to God all the time. In verse 10, it states, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem, toward Jerusalem. <laughs> He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. So what do we learn from this? God is always there. There are many obstacles in life. Um, in those times, we must grow through what you go through. Go grow through what you go through. If you're alive, you survive through tough times. Just because time, doesn't, just because time goes by doesn't mean that your mindset must remain the same. You can't complain and remain, you must change and adapt. Complaining is the epitome of a life that is not Christ-like. Did Jesus focus on only the bad? Maybe he was aware of bad things, but Jesus changed the world by helping others. He didn't sit around, he at least did something about it, right? And relating to God is always there, I'd like to say that he should be the one who you should turn, on, turn to first. From personal experience, I know that it is so easy to just tell a friend or family member what happens as soon as the situation is over. Like, hey, guess what happened? But um, everyone wants, to, wants everyone to know their business. But how do we forget to turn to God first? The creator of the universe, right? Consistency with God strengthens our relationship with him. This not only benefits ourselves, but also those with worldly views who watch from afar. If we don't go to God all the time and display our love and trust in him, why should they, right? So to summarize, throughout, through Daniel's faith in Christ, he was able to survive a night in a lion's den without being harmed. His consistent effort to put into his, his consistent effort to put into his relationship with God was seen through his continuous prayer three times a day, even when the law ordered him not to. Through his self-discipline, sacrifice, and strength, three S's, he showed constant effort in a relationship with God and reaped the utmost benefits. We too can be like Daniel and stay consistent in our relationships with Christ in order to ultimately display God's glory to the world. Um, that's the end of my message, but I would just like to thank ALCF for being consistent with me through, um, <laughs> through your prayers while I embark on my journey to leave home. Um, if you're unaware, I'm graduating next week, um, next Sunday, so glory to God for that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I will be attending USC and majoring in a multifaceted degree in arts technology in the business of innovation. Um, and consistency, by the way, was definitely needed throughout my high school career in order to get to this point. But again, thank you, church family, for loving my family and I unconditionally and always being a great support. Um, and special thanks to my dad and Mr. Lakeith and my mom and Miss Ann. Um, and then finally, I just want to emphasize that God is always there in the good times and the bad when you're on the top of the hill and in the bottom of the valley because God is good all the time. and all the time. All right. Thank you.